My name is Dagmara Bożek. I'm an employee of Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences, and I'm working at the Department of Science Communication and Education. The Surviving the Arctic topic is connected with the educational toolkit that we prepared uh, within the Polar Star project. It was the international uh, project where we prepared the part uh, dedicated to polar regions and we covered uh, five uh, Arctic topics, which one of them was uh, surviving the Arctic. So um, maybe at the very beginning, I will send you the link to the toolkit because uh, it contains a lot of uh, ad additional uh, materials like uh, worksheets for students. So if you are teachers, and you uh, wanted to want to use it during your classes with your pupils feel free to download download it and share with the, the other educators and teachers so it would be the uh, short summary let's say of the toolkit what kind of uh, materials you can find there and of course uh, some uh, in pieces of information concerning the Arctic area. So uh, to start with, uh, the, Ar the Arctic is the very worst uh, region in the Northern Hemisphere, and it is surrounding the North Pole. So there are also, of course, uh, the Arctic Ocean, which is uh, covered by sea ice. And of course, some um, countries have the some territories, the northern territories in the high Arctic. So um, there are some of them and we will discuss it later on. And um, yes, uh, here is the map where we can find uh, pieces of information concerning the Arctic region, uh, what does it look like. And the total area, uh, as you can see, is uh, 45 uh, million kilometers. And the Arctic Ocean is uh, uh, one, um, as you can see, it is uh, a very big uh, part of the, the Arctic territory. Uh, it's uh, very, when we are comparing the polar zones, uh, the Antarctica is the continent. So there is the ice cap and here is the sea ice. So it's uh, it's different. Uh, you know uh, that uh, we are talking now uh, m many more about uh, the global change, um, global climatic changes and uh, the, the sea ice in the Arctic, which is uh, melting. So the uh, ice uh, cover here is uh, actively and dynamically changing all the time and it affects uh, people, uh, plants, animals that live uh, in that area. So that's why the um, the topic is uh, dedicated to surviving, survival uh, issues uh, because of the some climatic changes. Uh, so uh, eight uh, territory, eight uh, countries ha have uh, their territories in the Arctic. So there are uh, listed on the, the here on the right side. Of course, there are some Scandinavian countries like Norway, Sweden, uh, Finland, uh, Denmark plus Greenland because um, uh, Greenland, the uh, big island located in the high Arctic is uh, under the administration of uh, Denmark. We have also Iceland, Russia, USA and Canada as well. And 4 million people live in the Arctic. Uh, of course, we are talking, talking and we are thinking about the indigenous people uh, and there are 10% of them and the rest one are non-indigenous -indig people who on the purpose to move to the high Arctic and live there. Uh, when talking about uh, the Arctic and um, the living condition here, uh, the first thing we need to focus on is um, some uh, weather factors, like uh, which has a very big impact on life in the Arctic. So uh, we have a very long and harsh winter. It is the main season of the year, let's say. And we have summer, which is uh, two months 
in the Arctic, more or less, and uh, two other seasons like spring, autumn, which are very, um, very short and symbolic, let's say. We have also two main phenomena like midnight sun and polar night, which uh, affects much uh, the, the, the organisms living in the Arctic. So it means that uh, we have very short vegetation period in the, in the Arctic, which is 50, 60 days, and uh, not much sunlight um, during the whole year, um, low temperatures, and uh, yeah, and the, the the long winter, which is uh, dominating uh, during the whole year, so it affects more the as I said the life of humans, plants and animals in the Arctic. When we are talking about the temperatures, um, we need to know that there is no one average temperatures. Uh, for whole Arctic regions. For example, on the Spitsbergen Island, uh, which belongs to Svalbard Archipelago, on the, uh, Spitsbergen is located Polish Polar Station Hornsund. It is wholly around um, scientific facility belong to my institute, the Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences. So during uh, winter, the temperature is minus 15 or something. So it's not that much. Minus 12, but uh, in the in Greenland we have, for example, uh, in interior minus 60. Uh, Yakutia is very cold region. It is minus 70. Around the North Pole it's minus 40 during the winter time. So as you can see, it's uh, hard to say that we have one uh, low temperature in the Arctic. So of course there are. Um, places where there is no life because of the very harsh climatic conditions. But in the other parts, like on Svalbard, as I said, uh, Iceland, uh, some coast, Greenland coasts, the people um, can survive and the same uh, works for the other organisms. When we are talking about the whole topic as the surviving in the Arctic, uh, we have two terms like adaptation and the habit. Adaptation is something uh, connected with the evolution where the organisms um, evolve in such way to live um, more or less comfortable in special region and uh, under the special weather circumstances. Uh, the habit is rather something we uh, used to do regularly. For example, uh, reading a book before going to sleep or something. Adaptation is something uh, which is um, permanent, permanent uh, and uh, connected with evolving the the process of uh, being uh, prepared for something. So when we are talking about the polar animals, the animals that live in polar regions. It's, for example, the thick fur uh, in winter time or something. We will discuss it, some examples of adaptation later on. In the educational toolkit I'm talking about, we prepared a lot of mind maps and because we want to, to encourage uh, students to work on their own, to create um, their own ideas, uh, put together using keywords. Uh, yeah, because uh, the toolkit and the whole topic surviving the Arctic is uh, rather something inspiring to search for more, to look for the other information concerning the Arctic. So uh, we wanted to show some factors that affect uh, animals, plants and humans. But uh, there are not all of them. I indicated only three ones uh, that I find the most important, but of course the students uh, can have their own. So the first one, the first uh, mind map I prepared was uh, about the plants connected with the plant adaptations. And I uh, and I indicated that temperature, sun and water is very important factors for 
living uh, of the plants uh, in the Arctic regions. So uh, the first one, of course, the photosynthesis, we uh, talked about the temperature conditions. We know about the polar night, the midnight sun, the pe vegetation period, which is very short from 50 to, until 60 days. So the photosynthesis also is uh, connected with uh, the uh, the period of the summer, which is very short. So uh, the plants can make the photosynthesis this way, like we have here in our uh, climatic zone in Poland, for example. So uh, that's why some um, plant species uh, evolve in such a way to absorb as many uh, sunlight as it is possible during that so, so, during that uh, short period. So uh, we have three examples of some uh, free um, arctic plants and their adaptations. So we have, for example, mountain avon. Uh, it is uh, the plant which is typical for not only the polar zones but also for um, mountain areas. It might be found, for example, in Tatra Mountains in Poland or Slovakia. But of course, it's bigger and it looks a little bit different, but it's still the same uh, species. Uh, so, um, for example, it has, as you can see, very beautiful flowers and they are able to track the sun movement across the sky because that's why it can absorb much uh, sunlight during the midnight sun. Swallower poppy is uh, similar to the poppy uh, we have in other climatic um, regions, climatic zones, but uh, the hairs on the stem and the fact that the stem is hollow inside also helps uh, the plant for at first uh, to retain heat and not to use too much energy to grow if the stem inside is hollow. And the polar willow, which is uh, growing in a big clumps, let's say groups, very close to the ground, because uh, close to the ground, the temperature is a little bit higher than, um, let's say, when uh, there is a buff. The, if there is m more uh, if there is uh, the height uh, above the ground level is higher, the temperature is lower in the Arctic conditions. We have also very strong winds there, so it is a better way to live close to the ground. And if you are in a group like polar willow, for example, um, or polar saxifrage, because it's not only the way of the adaptation of polar willow, it you can uh, absorb more heat and it's uh, warmer. Permafrost. Uh, for plants, it's very uh, limiting, let's say, because in polar regions, we have the, polar, uh, the permafrost, which means the permanently frozen ground um, in a period at least two years or more. So we have, as you can see on the very short, uh, very simple um, graphic that we have the plants which are growing on the surface, soil, very thick one uh, layer, and the permafrost. The depth of the permafrost might be one kilometer or even more depending on the region. Uh, and because of the permafrost, the trees, for example, or bigger uh, plants can't um, create a big root system. So it means that we have, uh, we haven't big plants and high plants in the Arctic. Of course, there are other factors like lack of the sunlight, um, very poor soils and so on. So in total, uh, also the permafrost affects uh, the, the growing of, of the plants in the uh, Arctic region. Tundra is very typical one. A typical biome uh, for the, the Arctic and um, mostly there are lichens and mosses. It's look like this. It's um, the picture was made on Spitsbergen 
it looks like a very uh, nice carpet to walk on, but <laughs> it's not. It's very muddy during the summertime. So rubber boots is the best option when you are going to the field. So Tundra uh, is um, a biome, which means um, the plants and animals that live in the special and uh, um, special climatic zone. So uh, for Tundra is typical for the Arctic, and that's why we have typical um, plants and animals who live there. In the toolkit, uh, we also prepared a short experiment concerning uh, the permafrost and the plants growing in uh, polar regions. We prepared two uh, glasses. It's the best option because you can see the, the roots uh, when it is in its glass. Mm, some uh, potting soil, sand, rice, Rice uh, is optional, but uh, I prepared it like this to be more uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, plasticine and of course, uh, water and some seeds. It might be sunflower or to uh, small tomatoes as well. Okay, so uh, the first uh, glass contains uh, the sand and rice mixture, both of them as the same uh, sand, and rice, uh, sand and rice lawyer. After that goes the plasticines, uh, plasticine, which stands for the um, permafrost. So it is nice to have it uh, very, um, uh, what has to say, the, the, the layer of the permafrost, the plasticine, doesn't need to be very thick, but you need to stick it on the walls of the glass because there should be no, um, no holes inside on, on the surface of the plasticine. After that goes the potting soil. And as you can see in the one jar, one glass, uh, the potting uh, sol soil layer is thinner than in the second one. And uh, what else? Uh, we can, of course, uh, put some seeds uh, in the potting soil or, or better and um, better and more comfortable for the experiment option is to use the small plants uh, that uh, are growing already. Uh, I used the small tomatoes for it. It was uh, very small, a uh, small plants uh, and I put it on in the, into the potting soil. And uh, what was the observations? The, the first, I made the experiment twice because uh, at the first time it was during the summer. I put both jars on the balcony and uh, there was uh, very hot uh, weather and I forgot one day to pour some water to the to the jar and uh, the plant um, died in the first uh, jar when there was a uh, very thin uh, layer of the potting soil and uh, so it also means something that uh, if we have thin uh, soil, thin soil layer, it is complicated to, to grow for the plants. And the second version of the experiment was more successful because I uh, remember about uh, pouring the water to the plants. But finally, after a three weeks observation, the potting, the, the, um, the jar with uh, the thicker uh, potting soil layer has bigger plant, but in comparison to the plant that have normal, regular um, uh, conditions without the plasticine as a permafrost, both uh, plants were rather small. So it was um, like um, uh, the, the observation was the thickness of the potting soil affects uh, the plant growing. And the same is with the permafrost like uh, plasticine because it's uh, like a barrier for the roots to penetrate inside the, the jar to the other parts of the, of the soil, let's say. And it affects the, the root system, which is uh, more poor than in comparison when comparing to the plant 
who has uh, normal uh, conditions for the living. So, of course, the whole description of the experiment you can find in the the toolkit and maybe you will have another observation concerning um, th that experiment because it depends on the type of the plant and so on the conditions uh, when uh, you put those jars uh, with the the plants or so and then so on but i think still uh, the plasticine and the thickness of the potting soil lawyer affect uh, the whole process of uh, plant development Another section is dedicated to animals. Um, of course, the whole educational package was uh, prepared in that way that uh, teacher can indicate what uh, part exactly he or she wants to use uh, during the classes. So it's not necessary to go through all the toolkit to have that topic fulfilled about the Arctic, but you can choose uh, the human adaptations, uh, plants or animals adaptations, and in the end we have a group activity, and I will of course uh, say a little bit about this. So the uh, mind map concerning animals, so of course uh, another factors I uh, have choose for that uh, part of the toolkit. It is uh, the cold protection, one factor, hibernation and water supply during winter. I found the, that factors important to the topic, but of course, if you will uh, work on the, that part of the or that, that section of, the, of the, the package, you can indicate your own factors, which are uh, most important for you. When we are talking about the hibernation, it's not typical for the Arctic animals uh, because of the harsh climate. So um, the polar bears don't hibernate during the winter time. Um, they just uh, sleep regularly. Sometimes they are having a nap. <laughs> when I w worked at the Polish Polar Station on Spitsbergen, we had uh, a big male polar bear who were <laughs> who was sleeping close to the station, and it was uh, for us a little bit. Uh, we, we were nervous because of this, but yeah, after. A few hours uh, he w went away because he, he took a rest enough and uh, wor wor was able to go uh, and to continue his journey. So, yes, uh, so they don't hibernate, only the uh, female polar bears who are pregnant uh, might hibernate, but it's not the hibernation which is, uh, which might, which which might be called uh, winter sleep because it's a little bit different. The state is similar, but it's not the, but it's not the same. Mm, so in that state of um, dormancy, the female polar bear uh, who expect the babies uh, spend in a um, snow den for a couple of months. And in the beginning of the new year in January, February, she gives birth to the cubs. Uh, of the other uh, the other uh, animals um, don't don't hibernate like reindeer, uh, polar foxes, and so on. Uh, of course, uh, there are some links in the presentation. So if you download uh, the whole package using the link I sent you, you can just go through them. And uh, another factor was uh, water supply. How the animals, Arctic animals cope with um, the water uh, supply during the winter time because uh, we have, they have only the sea ice, uh, the, the, the water, the sea water, which is salty and uh, for example, for human, it's uh, not, <laughs> it's not uh, useful. And the, the other things like streams and other um, sources of water on the surface uh, are frozen. So unfortunately, they might be not used. Uh, so the animals uh, evolve in like the polar bears and the reindeers in such way that they can uh, live without uh, for a couple of time without water because they are able, for example, to absorb as um, 
much water as they can from the food they they eat or uh, during uh, the chemical reactions that uh, um, are carried out inside their organisms con connected with the digestion also uh, uh, can um, save some water from they can save uh, some water from it uh, so yeah there are a, a couple of uh, examples of the adaptations connected with the living without uh, water uh, for a couple of time uh, and it also is uh, yes it makes them more um, well prepared to to live uh, in the arctic during the winter time polar bear is very typical and uh, of the animal which is well adapted to arctic conditions there is uh, a lot of adaptations uh, for example thick fur which insulate very good the animals from uh, losing the heat in, in during the low temperatures the paws of uh, polar bear as you can see are um, has a special um, papilla uh, which uh, help them not to uh, slip on this uh, on on the icy surface the harsh claws also help them to move very fast and effective on ice and the the thick uh, layer of snow the paws uh, on as is uh, visible uh, on that uh, graphic on the left side are very white and that's why for example a polar bear is able to um, go on on snow surface snowy surface effectively sometimes when we are thinking if it's possible for the human to escape uh, from uh, the running polar bear not it's not um impossible it's not possible just because uh, when we are not on skis or i don't know ski rackets or something uh, we can't escape polar bear is too fast because of his adaptations Here are another animals uh, living in the Arctic. So uh, we know about the polar bear, but uh, of course uh, we have here the polar fox, uh, uh, polar wolf, seal, it's a birded seal, reindeer, uh, and uh, rock ptarmigan, the bird typical, to, typical for the Arctic and for, for Svalbard because it is the only bird uh, species that um, live uh, that that uh, stay for the whole winter at uh, Svalbard Archipelago, because the rest of the birds are flying in some more um, warm regions. Uh, for example, um, the Arctic fox has a very uh, thick fur during the winter time and the same is true for the reindeer and uh, the polar wolf as well and uh, it as well has a very bushy and long tail and it might be used as a scarf during the the winter time the same also is uh, true for the polar wolf uh, the seals living in the cold regions because seals are typical for arctic and antarctic regions um it has a very uh, thick fur uh, thick uh, layer of fat which is called blubber and it is inside uh, under the skin and it insulates uh, very much very very good the internal organs so it means that uh, the skin of the seal is cold when we touch it uh, because it doesn't lose much uh, heat from their body and it helps them to retain heat uh, another thing is uh, for example polar, polar wolves uh, ha has uh, smaller ears and smaller muzzle when we compare that arctic species to those who live in the europe for example it is also a way of adaptation not to lose so many so much heat from the the body uh, 
the reindeers has, uh, for example, fur of the bottom of their hooves uh, because also it isolates uh, from the cold and uh, also during the winter time it has longer hair on the muzzle because uh, reindeers are searching for the food beneath the snow and they need to dig for lichens or mosses um, in, in, in the snow so the long uh, fur is helping match them and the rock ptarmigan uh, it is uh, the bird who stays for the whole winter um, on Svalbard archipelago as I said uh, but it's not only typical for Svalbard archipelago but for whole Arctic as well and it has the feather um, almost everywhere uh, even on the eyelids their foot uh, legs so it looks like uh, very nice uh, uh, trousers white ones uh, and uh, it is uh, totally uh, white during the winter so it's also a way of camouflage uh, for that animal and uh, finally we have the third uh, section of our uh, toolkit it is uh, part dedicated to humans and I indicated uh, the factors like cold protection like uh, vitamin D and water supply during winter as an important factor when we are talking about the human adaptations uh, to the Arctic climate. As we said in the very beginning of the presentation about 4 million people uh, live in Arctic 10% of them, it is indigenous uh, people. Uh, the rest one, the, the rest of the, the people uh, travel to Arctic, stay there for a couple of time to work or to live uh, for shorter or, long, or longer pre period. But uh, Arctic environment, it's not a natural for them. So, um, here is the table and in the toolkit there is uh, kind of the exercise uh, for the students because we can think about um, the examples uh, about the uh, concerning with the uh, human adaptation um, when we are talking about the vitamin d uh, the indigenous people uh, don't need so much vitamin d like uh, the europeans for example it's uh, one of the differences because they adapt in that way uh, because they live, live uh, for a many centuries in place which were very unfriendly to humans. Now, of course, the situation is different because the civilization um, came to the high Arctic and those people have uh, another diet like it uh, they used to have uh, some time ago so now the lack of vitamin d is not a problem but uh, yes it is uh, the one of the adaptations um, when we are thinking about uh, water supply problems uh, it is a problem for non-indigenous people because we are um, not uh, adapt to drink all the time the water melting uh, melt water from i don't know glacier and uh, the ice uh, and that problem uh, what it was a problem for people who for example worked uh, for many for much for for long time in scientific facilities scientific bases in polar region um, in the Arctic and in the Arct Antarctic, Poland has two um, stations who work all the time. They are all year round facilities, scientific facilities. And the people who work there in the 50s or in the 60s and 70s uh, meet the problem of the water uh, which were, which was melt water because there was not enough um, let's say vitamins and other um, nutrients that are needed for our organism and when they come back to Poland for example they had a terrible problem with the teeth or with nails uh, with bones for example and now uh, in stations uh, 
very often the mine mineral water is used. Some of them uh, are uh, prepared, um, supplied um, in the station using some special uh, supplements. Other uh, stations, for example, order um, bottle uh, mineral water. So nowadays it's not a problem. Uh, for the in indigenous people, that was not a problem because they cope with it for many times. So they their organism the organisms work different than ours. And the cold protection, uh, of course, when we are thinking about the modern architecture of the polar regions, uh, it is um, very well adapt and uh, very well built uh, for the people so the houses are warm inside there is not a problem but traditionally uh, people living in the arctic made uh, houses from snow like igloo or from animal skin like yaranga or um, chum which were typical and still are typical for some si siberian peoples um when we are talking also the uh, scientific basis, because it's very interesting uh, factor and um, topic uh, in total, um, the stations are built on a special, uh, let's say, I don't know how it's called in English. Oh God, um, it's not directly on the surface uh, because uh, the surface is moving. Uh, during the summertime is towing, during the winter time it's freezing. So you know the, the ground is, is moving. So for the houses and other buildings that want that might be not good and uh, they might be uh, demolished um, after a couple of years. So that's why they are not uh, put directly on the ground. They use special construction uh, on which they build the houses and it and it works. It's special kind of construction used uh, in polar regions where there is a permafrost. And uh, finally, we are going to the work group. Uh, it might be separate part of the whole educational package. It might be like separate uh, project for the students or the homework. Um, it's connected with the designing of the equipment for a polar expeditioner, um, which uh, who works uh, in the field using snowmobile, a motorboat, or go goes uh, to the glacier uh, to, for example, take some samples or, and so on. And it might be done in five, two um, ways. The first one is the table when we can. Uh, write some examples some ideas and uh, the solutions are divided into three groups three categories uh, the first category is the part of the equipment that um, might uh, or is specially designed for saving life in dangerous situation the second category is that uh, the equipment is protecting us from cold and the third one of course, also very important is that uh, the equipment is comfortable because uh, we use it all the time. Sometimes we spend in the field many hours, so we need to have comfortable um, clothes uh, and the rest of the equipment. And we have a table and we have also the drawing for those who like to draw. Uh, and yeah, we had uh, groups who preferred uh, the second option and they draw a lot of interesting stuff uh, on their piece of piece of paper. And yeah, and after that, we made a short competition, which uh, whose drawing was the best <laughs> and uh, with many details. Uh, so the whole exercise you can find uh, in the package in the uh, in two of those options and yes this is it for today i know it was a very big shortcut of the topic which is very vast and has a lot of uh, factors and uh, things connected with it uh, you can find the whole educational 
the package uh, on the link I sent you using a chat. You can still find uh, the link here. If you will have some questions later on, I can send you also uh, to the email address some information. Okay, thank you so much and have a nice day. See you, bye-bye. <music>